Now, this one actually comes from, I think it was four weeks ago, Pastor Joe made a message, uh, or in his uh, sermon, made a, a reference to uh, commerce on the Sabbath. And I thought I would dig into that a little bit more today and uh, and go into some depth on it and understand it. And uh, it's a topic that is really a problem and has been a problem with all Sabbath keepers from the time of Israel on, um, because there are they, we often find ourselves in situations where there are people who want to sell stuff to us and that we would like to buy on the Sabbath. And often we're in societies where that's a common thing to do. And so um, we'll look at all of that in the study today. And so for history, for our recent history anyway, uh, until the 1970s, uh, life in America and North America, really, and probably most of Europe, was different than it is now in, in a lot of ways. Um, most businesses were closed for the, the entire weekend, um, and, and some would stay open for one day. And if they did stay open for one day on the weekend, it would be just Saturday, and, and pretty much everybody was closed on Sunday. And the Sunday closing was part of the Catholic Church uh, and their changes to the Sabbath. And we'll talk about that some more, too. Um, and so... Um, the people did more at home because they they didn't go out on on the weekends as much um, for commercial reasons, or maybe they went out to parks and and did things like that, uh, walk and uh, those sort of those kind of things, but not uh, things that involve commerce because uh, especially on Sunday, so much was closed down and you couldn't go and shop if you wanted to, um, and so people stayed at home more. They fixed things more at home. They built more at home. And they managed their lives at home more. Uh, you because they didn't have much money back then. Um, and I remember that from my childhood. My parents and, and nobody else had a lot of money, not like we do now. We are a much more uh, money oriented society, and we have a lot more money to spend than uh, than people that I knew, and certainly my parents back in those days. And and so they would manage their lives better. They would uh, try to waste less and and be more uh, less frivolous about how they spent their money. And now we kind of have money to throw around, and and we do that. And so that's another reason why we find ourselves in a society now that has um, a lot of things available to us to buy on the Sabbath. And so I want to define a word here: um, Sunday keeping. There are different definitions for this, and I want to make sure you understand the right one and and the one I'm going to be using here. Uh, a Sunday keeper, and my family were Sunday keepers when I was a kid, and a Sunday key keeper is a person who rests on Sunday as though it was the Sabbath. And so what they're doing is they're following the Catholic Church's instructions, saying that we move the Sabbath to Sunday, and you now must rest on the Sunday. And and so Sabbath uh, keeping um, became, in the eyes of the Catholic Church, uh, Sunday keeping. And, and so it's still resting on that day. It isn't going to church on Sunday. It is resting on that day. And so you can say about most of the people in uh, normal Christianity right now is that none of them, almost none of them are Sunday keepers. They don't keep the Sunday as though it was a Sabbath. They don't uh, believe they need to rest on that day. They do whatever they want on, on Sunday. And, um, and so uh, because of uh, the Sunday keeping at, that was going on in the, in the pre 1970s, um, they didn't have much incentive to go out and shop on Sunday because there was really no places open to do that. Um, the shops would have been closed on Sunday, and that was all part of this thing that the Catholic Church had done. So it was pretty easy for them to to do that, to rest on Sunday as though it was the Sabbath, and and they did that. Um, but then in the 1970s, starting in the 1970s. And it started at different places, really, in, in the country, um, some some quicker, some later. But in, I've, I've talked about this before, but you'll have to uh, go with it again. Uh, beginning in about the 1970s, businesses started opening on Saturdays and Sundays. And that was often a fight in the towns and cities where it happened, um, because some of them opposed that and, and tried to keep it from happening. But it, it did happen anyway. And, and the result of that was an increase in employment. There were a lot more jobs avail available. And uh, people, so people had more money, more people had more money. Um, and also at the same time, governments, uh, and really starting in the 60s more, the, the government started spending money they didn't have. And they've been on that spending binge ever since. And so as a result of those two things, the increased employment and, and more money going flowing through the system, there was more money in people's hands and more money moving through the economy. And so, and also businesses would started to open up on Saturday and Sunday. And so uh, for people who were Sunday keepers or Sabbath keepers, um, they found themselves in a situation where there were things available to buy on their uh, on the Sabbath uh, as they understood it. I'm not saying Sunday keeping is right. 
Um, so the Sabbath keeping um, started with an entire group of people with Israel. At least that's the where we know of it for sure in the Bible. But there are indications that it did the Sabbath keeping did happen before that. But Israel was the first kind of society where it was given as a law, and everyone in Israel kept it. And and so it's it's easier to keep the Sabbath when everyone else is doing it. And so even though you might not appreciate it. Um, you, there isn't anything you can do about it. You can't go and buy something if there's nobody there who's going to sell it to you. And, and so it was easy that way. But, but since then, and, and even for Israel in, in those uh, other days, um, people started coming into Israel to try and sell their stuff. And, um, uh, and we in our time have the same situation. We are Sabbath keepers mixed in with a whole bunch of non-Sabbath keepers. And, and so we find ourselves in a society where there are services and goods being offered on the Sabbath all of the time. And there are pressures for us to get involve ourselves in that and and to go out and buy things on that and it and it seems so convenient and and it's also nice to be like everyone else not standing out and and not having to say some to somebody no we can't do that because it's the sabbath and having to explain to them well the sabbath is the day where we rest and we don't do any commerce or anything else like that and and so it's it's easier just to go along and get along and and uh, not stand out and, and so that's one of the pressures that Sabbath keepers um, have always faced in these uh, societies when they, they've lived in. And, and also, we, we could also begrudge the fact that we don't have that same freedom that the non-Sabbath keepers have. They can go and shop on any day, and, and we, have, we don't have that freedom, and we could uh, be maybe unhappy about that. And, and it, it makes life a little uh, less con convenient. So... What we have in our society now is that there are Sabbath keepers who want those services on the Sabbath and, and they're available there and they want to take advantage of them. And, and so what happens is a lot of these Sabbath keepers find a reason to, to tell themselves that they aren't breaking the Sabbath. And so they, they make up reasons for that. Um, and, and so they say, well, what I'm doing isn't work, perhaps. Uh, so it's, it's OK for me to do this. And we're going to look at some Bible verses right away here uh, that, that where people are doing the exact same thing. And so these pressures that we experience in a society that offers everything on every day um, are, are pressures that, that we fight against because we know we aren't supposed to be doing them. Um, and nonetheless, those things are there and available. And the temptation is that we will try to compromise and, and find some way to make the Sabbath all right and, and say that we're still do, uh, doing the Sabbath, but um, it's uh, a little different. So we'll go back to Nehemiah. Now, remember Nehemiah's situation. Um, what's happened is um, the Israelites were all uh, driven out of Israel, uh, taken as captives to Babylon, and then Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persians. And, and now they finally returned and, and with Nehemiah helping them build the wall and, and rebuild their society and also rebuild their religion, their foundations at, in that. Because while they were gone, they really forgot a lot of what Judaism was about. And even before they had been captured, they really had left Judaism in many ways. And that's why they were captured and dragged off because they had gone so far away from God. So that's the situation here is that Nehemiah is trying to restore Sabbath keeping uh, to the people. And, and so this is from Nehemiah 13, 15 through 17. It says, in those days, I saw in Judah people who were treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sacks of grain and loading them on donkeys, as well as wine, grapes, figs and every kind of load. And they were bringing them into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So I admonished them on the day that they sold food. So this is one group of people. He, he sees them doing uh, work things on there and, and he uh, gets after them and says, what are you doing then? This is wrong. And so there's another group, though, that he also addresses. And, and also people of Tyre were living there who imported fish and all kinds of merchandise and sold them to the sons of Judah on the Sabbath, even in Jerusalem. So the people from Tyre are not Israelites. They're foreign people bringing in goods. And, and then I reprimanded the nobles of Judah and said to them, what is this evil thing that you are doing by profaning the Sabbath day? So Nehemiah is, has um, been trying to uh, restore all of what the Bible requires of people uh, into Israel, but he's struggling with that because a lot of the people are tempted. In, in the first case here, uh, we're going to see that uh, people have um, are, are working on the Sabbath and they've, they've given themselves excuses why they think that that's okay. And, and in the bottom group with the people of Tyre, they've also done much the same thing. They've given themselves an excuse about why they can do this. So 
for the, the first case, the, the businessmen were restocking their stores on the Sabbath. And, and so what had happened is they had defined work as only the selling of goods. So they had kind of reduced it from what the Bible said on to, on, down to something that would work for them. And, and they said, well, okay, if I can't sell my goods, then certainly I can do the preparation and I can reload my shop and I can uh, stomp the grapes and I can do all those sorts of things as long as I just don't sell anything on the Sabbath. And, and so that's how they got around it is they, they gave the Sabbath a new definition uh, that way. For the second group who were buying from the people from another land, um, they had really much done the same thing. Uh, they were buying from these people on the Sabbath. And, and they had defined work as only selling and not buying. So, so if there was someone there who was willing to sell on the Sabbath, then it would be okay for them to buy on the Sabbath. And, and in both of these cases, uh, Nehemiah says, no, that's wrong, and, and uh, corrects them on that. So this is always the temptation. We, when we have this opportunity to go out and, and, and live as the world lives, uh, we can be dragged into it. And the way we do things is we compromise, we find different ways. And we'll talk about some of those different ways near the end. And, and there are lots of different ways that we do that. But we, we find, uh, we, because we have bad hearts, honestly, we, we find reasons, we go out in search of reasons why we can uh, twist the Sabbath or, or think of it in a different way or, or do something like that that will make it okay to do what we really wanted to do anyway. So, the question comes up is why do they have that wrong definition for what the work is on the Sabbath? And, and the, the history of the Sabbath is really a story of people making the Sabbath fit into their lives instead of, uh, instead of fitting their lives into the Sabbath and, and building the Sabbath into their lives. They try to make the Sabbath fit in so they can still have the lives that they want to have. And really what that's about is about getting the Sabbath out of the way of their lives. And so they, they, they come to see the Sabbath as being in the way and causing them to not be able to enjoy all the things that they want to enjoy. And because of that, they, the Sabbath is a nuisance for them. And so we have that idea expressed in Isaiah 58, 13. And it says, if because of the Sabbath, you restrain your foot from doing as you wish on my holy day and call the Sabbath a pleasure and the holy day of the Lord honorable, and honor it, desisting from your own ways. And that continues on, but I wasn't going to continue on with that. But the point I'm pulling out of that is, call the Sabbath a pleasure. And, and a lot of people who are Sabbath keepers don't call the Sabbath a pleasure because they find the, the Sabbath is in their way. And, and so if you love God's ways, the Sabbath isn't a struggle, and it is a pleasure. But if it, if you don't love God's ways, then the Sabbath becomes a drag. It, it's always in your way and you despise it because it's always a nuisance. It's always stopping you from doing what you want to do. It's always in your way. And so this, this difference in the heart is, is really what we're talking about here, is um, if you love God's ways, you will find a, a way to fit the Sabbath, uh, make it, <laughs> I don't want to say fit it into your life. I want to say fit your life around the Sabbath so that it works for you. And, and I know in my own experience that there were some adjustments that are made, but now it feels very natural. The Sabbath is never in my way. It's something that I plan for, something I'm ready for, something I enjoy, and it's not a problem. And it's not a difficult thing. But if, you're, if your mindset is the other way around, the Sabbath is, you're going to find it always in your way. You, you say, oh man, it's the Sabbath. I wish I could do this instead. And, and that attitude is the problem attitude. Um, you, you shouldn't be um, thinking of the Sabbath in that way. And, and kind of a sideline point here, uh, Nehemiah's solution to this is that he uh, locks up Jerusalem on the Sabbath so that people can't go in or out and, and the businesses can't come in and bring their wares to try and sell them. And, and so he kind of uses force to get people to follow the Sabbath. And, and um, that, that's all he can do. Um, he, he can lecture people all he wants, but the people may not change. Um, and, and you can't change people by forcing them to do what is right either. They need to change their own hearts. They need to make that change themselves and their attitude so that they will see the Sabbath as a pleasure and not as a pain. And um, and people don't willingly do that so many times. Um, the majority of people will always take the easy route if they can find it and, and do that instead. And so this, this difference in the heart and that need for a change of heart is, is really our focus here, not so much the commerce on, on the Sabbath, but how you view the Sabbath. So... How does God define work? And that was really the problem that we saw in both those cases, is that um, the Bible isn't always as clear as we would like to about this. And, and I think there's a reason for that. Um, God wants us to find uh, a, a definition of work that fits our current societies. Our society now is not like uh, the societies back then. 
and and so we we need to f uh, find the Sabbath that we can keep in in here while still keeping the truth of the truth of the Sabbath. And so what we really want to dig down to is how does God define work? And and to understand that we need to understand that the present Sabbath that we do every week that we keep every week is an observance that foreshadows that future Sabbath. And we've talked about this many times in the past. And so in this future Sabbath, that will be a time when we won't do any work at all. We won't need to do any work to feed ourselves, to earn income, to do anything like that. Um, life, life will be easy. There won't be any work. Uh, there won't be any hardships, um, no struggling, none of those sort of things that we live with in our lives, uh, no complications that make our lives difficult. And and so if we if we look at the present Sabbath as an observance of that existence, then it helps us to understand how we can bring the Sabbath into our lives here. And so God's definition of work is really anything that you won't do in that future Sabbath, that, that uh, eternal Sabbath that we will uh, attain to eventually. And so, um, so anything done to maintain your life is, is really what that work is. So anything that you need to do to keep yourselves alive, uh, fed, um, keep yourselves going, all of those uh, sorts of things are work according to God. So, so that would include in the cases that we're looking at here, both selling and buying goods because you need to buy food so that you can put it on the table for people to eat. And so you're maintaining your life in that. And so God's definition of work is, is really about um, all of the efforts that we have to go through to uh, to maintain our, our existence, to keep our lives going. And so in the present, and, and really any time in the, in the past, everything is pretty much work. Almost everything that we do in life has something to do with earning income so that we can continue to feed ourselves and build our houses and do all the things that we need to, to live and exist. And, and uh, God does recognize this. And, and I wanted to point out some things in this table here. These are all of the different Sabbaths. Uh, this is the weekly Sabbath. These are the Sabbath feast days and, um, and spring and fall feasts. Both are those together. And, uh, and I want you to see something here um, that God talks about what kind of work is not allowed on these. And it's not the same. Um, um, there are different uh, levels of what kind of work is allowed on these different days. So for, for the weekly Sabbath, um, it, the Leviticus 23 is going to be our main reference text here. It says, uh, you shall not do any work. And, and so we're kind of left with, okay, great, what's work? And, and we don't understand it so well, but we understand it a little better by, by seeing how these other feast days are. So most of the normal feast days, it says, you shall not do any laborious work. Okay, so on those feast days, you can do light work. And, and so you could do a little bit of, of work, um, maybe just kind of puttering around the house, fixing up some things, uh, nothing, uh, nothing hard, nothing difficult. If, if now in our society, our societies are, tend to be more technical and, and less uh, laborious. So if we have a job where we uh, use our mind an awful lot more than our body, then you would want to be relaxing your mind. And so you wouldn't do any laborious thinking or, or stuff like that. So there's that idea there that there's a different level. So for the normal feast days, you're allowed to do a little bit of work, but nothing laborious. And so that makes them different from the weekly Sabbath. Now on Yom Kippur, uh, we see something different there, very different. It says you shall not do any work at all. And, and that includes fasting. So on Yom Kippur, you could do no work. And so that helps us to understand a little bit about God's definition of work. And that is that the work is really about the effort at maintaining yourself. And so Yom Kippur being the holiest day of the year, you aren't even allowed to fast. You aren't, sorry, you aren't even allowed to eat. And, and so you fast for that entire day. And that's a, a required fast day. And, and so we, we see in that, that this on the most holiest day of the year, um, that the constriction is down to just those things that you wouldn't do in heaven. So it, um, you won't need to eat in heaven, even that. Uh, so even the work of, of eating and, uh, you, of course, if you're not going to eat, you don't need to prepare to eat. So um, you see there a different level of a more, a tighter level of no work there. And then that, that makes it a little um, tighter than the, the weekly Sabbath, which is a little tighter than the feast day Sabbath. And, and uh, Sukkot, the other feast days, are really much the same. Uh, you shall not do any laborious work. Uh, you shall not do any laborious work. So what we see in those is um, there are different levels of what work is allowed because God knows that there are situations where you can't uh, not do work all, all the time. And so 
for Passover, which is which is the uh, a week long uh, feast of unleavened bread. Um, you you can do a little bit of work because God knows you need to do something for that that week. Um, you you can't just do nothing all of that week, and and so um, He allows a little bit of work there so you can kind of keep things up and do a little bit of what you need to do, but He still doesn't want laborious work to be happening, and and so that gives us a lot of understanding of the Sabbath that way. That the Sabbath is something that we need to strive to to reduce that work as much as possible on our weekly Sabbaths. And um, and this gives us that idea that uh, on the weekly Sabbaths, we can still eat. Um, and so we can eat what we've prepared on the previous day. We aren't supposed to be preparing food on that day, but we can uh, still uh, eat on that day. But um, any kind of work, like anything to do with maintaining your house or anything like that would, would be something you shouldn't be doing on that day. But you could you could do that on one of the other days or the like Shavuot, for example. Yes, Anybody? and I was I was going to say also that <clears throat> this is not even done in the Church of God. You know, they they don't want to speak about that or preach about that uh, because they want to have a lot of flexibility. Uh, it's gotten to where everybody goes out to eat and everybody goes to do this and that. So long as it's fun, maybe I'll watch a movie. At least I'm not working. Or maybe I'll go shopping. At least, I'm, you know, and maybe I won't even buy. I'll just shop for now. And, and there's a lot of um, in, in carelessness about the Sabbath. And what I think is that uh, every time that, that I wanted to touch on the subject previously, the previous church, they would say, oh, you're, there you are being very doctrinal or very legalistic. And they didn't want to hear any of that, you know, so... I don't know, but but I don't think they're the only ones like that. I think a lot of people, a lot of churches are like that as well. And I'm talking about Sabbath keeping churches because, well, suddenly they're not even keeping the Sabbath at all. No. Yeah, and and that's a good point. Um, that carelessness and and it society that we live in tends to grind that down for you. When you see all of these people being able to do stuff on a day of the week when you can't do stuff that can wear on you and when we need to be aware that it does wear on us and so sometimes you say well I don't, it's just too much work i don't want to do this anymore and and you find a way to like you're saying uh, to go shopping when you shouldn't and we'll talk about that shopping some more here okay restaurants on the sabbath is going to be kind of the, the next section here um it, it really isn't that different from what we've been talking about here um uh, restaurants are not selling a product like uh, grain or something like that they're they're selling a service but nonetheless, something is being sold. And so really nothing changes here, um, but we'll, we'll go through it this way in, in more detail. And so Sabbath keepers want to say it's okay because they aren't doing any work. And that's exactly what Pastor Joe was talking about. You say, well, I'll just go around the mall and look in the stores, but I won't buy anything. Well, we'll talk about what that really means uh, a little bit later on here. And, and we often justify it, even the buying, and, and we say, well, the business is open. That's not my fault. I can't control that. Um, and so if they want to be open, then I can buy there. That'll be all right. And those are all compromise ideas. That's not what the Sabbath is, is about. Um, anything to do with maintaining your life is, is work, and you shouldn't be doing that on the weekly Sabbath. So we'll go back to the original Sabbath commandment and see something from that that leads us to it. And we might ask the question, how did Nehemiah know what, what work was and, and know that these people were working when they shouldn't be? Even though they weren't selling uh, their goods, they were still preparing their shops and building up their product lines. And so uh, that's where we're headed here in this section. So Exodus, Exodus 20, 9 through 10 is the original Sabbath commandment. And um, the one in Deuteronomy 5 is really much the same here, so I haven't done both, just one of them. And so it says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. So I've highlighted all of those yous and yours um, to make a, a point here that everybody misses when they look at this commandment. It, it, the whole commandment is written in terms of you uh, and your, and never they, him, her, it. None of those things are, are, are ever used. It's always you. And so we need to look at, at why it's written that way. And it's written, and it can be written other ways. It could be written as 
Okay, now it's, it might say six days everyone shall labor and go and do all their work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, you, in it no one shall do any work, the fathers and the mothers or the sons and the daughters, the male or the female servants or the cattle or the sojourners who stay in the country. So you, you could uh, write it that way, but that's not the way it's written. It's written in terms of you and your. And, and so um, looking at writing it this way, well, once you've written it this way, you could actually take a whole bunch out and reduce it down to six days everyone shall labor, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it, no one shall do any work. And you could finish the commandment right like that. But that isn't what happens. Um, God has that whole thing written out with yous and yours in it for a purpose. And, and so we ask the question, who is you? Who's the, the you that's being refer, referred to there? And it, it's a person who isn't mentioned in all that list of other people. It's not the sons or the daughters. It's not the slaves. It isn't the uh, work animals. Uh, none of those things that are all listed there um, is not the you. The you is another person that isn't listed or named. And, and, and so that, that person is the person who has authority, all of these other things that are listed. And so it's the person who has authority over themselves, of course. Now, a slave doesn't have authority over himself. And so a slave wouldn't be that, that you. But um, you would be uh, have authority over yourself and maybe others. You could have authority over your children or servants or cattle, whatever you might have. So the you is is a person who isn't listed there, and it's a person who has authority over themselves and maybe others. And, and so when we understand that, we can see that in the households that they had at that time, that was the father or the mother. That was the person who was the chief of the household. And, the, and, and as the head of a household, all of the work that's to be done in the household is your work. And, and so even if you had a large household with lots of sons and daughters and servants and everything else, um, the, the head of the household was in charge of administering the household and making sure that all of the work got done. And you were the person who would tell the others who, what to do and when to do it, and they would do that work. And so they were doing your work and, and in doing everything on your, in, in, in your household. So the you in here is the person who's in charge of the household, the person who makes the decisions about who does what and when, and that's the you that's being referred to in here. And so when the Bible says you rest and your sons and your daughters, that means you are responsible for those people. Um, you, they are doing your work and, and you are responsible for them doing your work. Um, and so when we understand the Sabbath that way, it, it gives us a clearer understanding of some other things that we're gonna get to here. So um, the Sabbath is, um, it says basically you or anyone you have authority over shall not do your work and and so you don't work and you can't pass your work off to others like children servants animals or foreigners and so that relates back to uh restaurants on the sabbath and, and restaurants on the sabbath are of course just one example of, of things that we could do in our society on the sabbath and so the staff at restaurants are doing your work they're they're cooking your meal they are doing your dishes they bring your food to you um, and, and so they are doing your work as though they were your servants. Uh, you, they are servants that you pay and tip, um, but they are still your servants. They are people that, are, that you are in charge of telling them what to do and they go and do it. So on the Sabbath, you should not be expecting them to work um, because you, you are in charge of them. If you go to their shop and, and say, I want you to make me a nice fine steak, um, they will go and do that. And, and so they are a servant of yours, a servant for pay. So, um, so that's how, how Nehemiah un understood um, these things as well. He understood that the Sabbath was about any kind of work and, and not just about um, selling things. It was anything to do with um, anyone that is you are in charge of. And so if you're in charge of uh, your family business, then your family business needs to be stopping work and all work that the family business does. So, um, also, and looking at this a different way, the people of the Sabbath, again, um, you're in expecting them to work, you are really taking away their opportunity to keep the Sabbath um, because their employer calls them in and says, I need you to work on Saturday. And, and that's because he's got customers there on, on Saturday. And so, and, and this is the same situation for all non-essential workers who work on, on Saturday is that um, they are brought in because there are people there who are buying the services, who want the services. And so if there were less people who wanted those services 
and there would be less people who would go and use those services and those services would not become available and, and people would shut down on the Sabbath. There was nobody there who would go and, and use their services. Nobody's, no business is going to stay open on a day when nobody's going to come and use their services. So you really are, um, in, in taking advantage of uh, services that are being provided in society on the Sabbath, you are uh, taking away their opportunity to keep the Sabbath. And that's really where Melody kind of finds herself, and, and Melody's not alone uh, on that way. Um, we, we live in a pagan world, and uh, there are all sorts of services that are required. They're essential services, and we understand that. But there are also non-essential services, um, like librarians, who, uh, people who have to come in because there are people who are going to be using, who want to use the library. So uh, what we find ourselves in in this pagan world is that um, there are many work schedules that include the Sabbath day as part of one of the days you have to work. And there are lots of essential services. I made a bit of a list here, but there are many more. Uh, firemen, police, military, hospitals, ambulances, drugstore staff, air conditioning service. Yes, air conditioning services in Texas are an, es an essential service. If you don't have air conditioning, you can die. So um, IT departments as well. So um, lots of things like that, that that keep everything running in, in our world that we need to, to in order to keep alive. These are the essential services. And so those people requ are required to work on the Sabbath. Now, this is a big difference between uh, orig original Israel when they received the Sabbath commandment is that they didn't have that kind of thing. They didn't have firemen, police, military, hospitals, those sorts of things. Um, that's part of our own society. But we understand these things the, the same way, is that they are essential services that, that we want. In Israel's time, if you managed to accidentally cut yourself and you needed um, medical help, then all of your friends would get together and do everything they could to, to try and help you. And the same situation exists here. Um, we are, uh, uh, and, and Jesus talks about that. He says, there, there are times when things will happen on the Sabbath. Um, he talks about bull in the ditch as his example, and when you have to get that bull out of the ditch or, or the bull is gonna die in the ditch. And, and so um, in the same way, if, if you uh, injured yourself on the Sabbath in Israel, then everybody would come together to help you and, and do whatever they could to make that better and, and so it wouldn't become worse. And so those essential services are, are something that we uh, need to take care of. And, and if you're severely, severely injured, you're going to call an ambulance, of course, um, because that's how we deal with those kind of problems nowadays. And, and so in, in this reality that we live in, we have that opportunity to take advantage of these things and they are essential services. They're not something that you could have planned for or prepared for on the Sabbath. They're something that just happened. And, and uh, the opportunity is there to take advantage of these. Um, and so if you seek employment in these professions, you need to work on the Sabbath. That's going to be expected of you. And, and um, because these businesses are required. And, and it's not so different for the non-essential services. Um, there are lots and lots of those that are things that, that you don't really have to have, but they're nice to have. And, and because there are people who take advantage of those things, um, those businesses are open, even if they, they really didn't have to be open on the Sabbath. Just a consequence of the society we live in. So sometimes despite the preparation that we might do for the Sabbath, something can go wrong and, it's, and it might be necessary to work on the Sabbath, uh, to engage in commerce on the Sabbath. And, and we should never be so rigidly locked into the Sabbath that we say, no, I will never do that. I would rather starve to death than, than um, go out and buy a meal on the Sabbath because the roast that I had, was cooking burned up into a crisp and there's nothing left for our family to eat. That's not what God wants. Um, the Sabbath, Jesus talks about that so many times. The Sabbath is for man, uh, and it's not to, it's to be a blessing for us, not to be a, a death march for us. So um, there will be times in our lives when it's necessary to do that commerce, and, and that's fine. God understands that. If you've done the preparation and things just went uh, wrong and, and you need to do something else, then yeah, go ahead and do something else. That's fine. But what uh, God doesn't want is he doesn't want us to diminish the Sabbath so that it becomes a, a day when we can go to the restaurant any, any Sabbath we want. We can go out shopping whenever we want on the Sabbath. Those things are, are all um, causing their work for us and they're causing other people to have to work as well. So kind of summarizing this, the best we can do is to do our best. But don't let that become an excuse to do less than your best. And, and that's really what Pastor Joe was talking about. There's a lot of Sabbath keepers who, who want to find some way, some uh, way to understand the Sabbath so that you can get away with doing that. So kind of summarizing what I've talked about here. Um, the Sabbath is a dividing line and it always has been. 
uh, from from Israel's time even to nine to now. And it's a line that divides the people into two different groups, those who call the Sabbath a pleasure, as we saw in that uh, verse before, and, and those who call the Sabbath a pain. And, and uh, there are lots of references in the Bible about this. I've chosen Amos 8.5, which is kind of my favorite one, to people who find the Sabbath to be a pain. And so these are people complaining away about how the Sabbath is keeping them from doing the things that they want to. And Amos 8.5 says, these are people complaining. When will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain and the Sabbath so that we may open the wheat market to make the ephah, that's the measurement of wheat, and the shekel, uh, the coinage, bigger and, and to cheat with dishonest scales? And, and so what they're, they want to do is the Sabbath is in their way. They want to go out and start selling grain and making money and, and opening up the wheat market. And, uh, and what's interesting here is that Amos ties this together with worse things. And, and so he's really saying that if you don't love the Sabbath and, and the Sabbath is always in your way, there may be other problems with you. You may be the kind of person who uh, reduces the quantity that you're selling, making it smaller than an, and the measurement is supposed to be and selling it that way, or you could be increasing the price, jacking up the price, or using dishonest scales to get your measurements. And and um, and so he's saying that um, if you don't love the Sabbath, then you don't love a lot of other things about God, and you're not the kind of person that God is really looking for. So for those people who call the Sabbath a pain, they search for and they find ways to get around it. And so I've made up a short list here. Um, one of the things that is most common in our society now is they say it doesn't apply in our time. And, and all of the most of the Christian churches, uh, Protestant churches uh, say that. And, and they have just they've decided all sorts of different reasons that allow them to say, no, the Sabbath was just for Israel. It isn't for our time. History says that's wrong. The Bible says that's wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, that's how a way that they have found to to be able to write off the Sabbath completely. And so it's never in their lives at all. Um, but there are some other people who were Sabbath keepers and, and they want to create a replacement Sabbath where you, there's nothing left for you to keep. And that's what's happening in our denomination right now. They're, they have this replacement Sabbath and you don't have to keep anything now. You can go out and go to restaurants and go shopping and do whatever you want on the Sabbath with this new Sabbath. And, and what we saw in earlier with the Nehemiah verses, um, people will also try to redefine work. And, and they had de defined work as being only the selling part. Uh, not the buying part. And, and so that made it possible for them to do a lot of their business stuff um, without calling it um, the Sabbath, we call it without calling it working on the Sabbath. And, and so that's another way of doing it is that people define work in a different way than the Bible defines it. And another thing that people often do is they just find excuses to ignore it. Um, they say, well, uh, it's in my way again. I want to go and do this. And so I'm going to go and do this. I think that that's only fair. And, and uh, so you find excuses to ignore it. And all of these are the signs of a, of a bad heart, a, a heart that really doesn't want God's word and, and may be also covering for other problems that are inside of you, as we saw with the Amos verses. Any questions? So what you're saying is uh, if it's an essential service that we need, then maybe it's OK. You know is that what you're saying? Yeah. And as I, I was thinking like like nurses in hospitals, and, you know, and uh, the police officers and firemen and people like that, you know, I, I don't think we want crime or, or the burning of a house you know, to continue. No, nope, definitely not. And, and that isn't what God wanted at all. Um, <clears throat> Sabbath was also also always to be something to benefit man. Um, but of course, we need to keep the Sabbath as much as possible. But when those situations come up, um, and I'll, I'll go back to that verse, the, the bull in the ditch. I just kind of referenced that. Uh, Jesus talks about that and he says, um, he's talking to the Pharisees at that time. And he says, if your bull falls into a ditch uh, and, is, and is trapped there and, and, and could possibly die in this ditch, ditches sometimes have water in them and, and the bull could die there stuck in the mud. And, and, and he says, you, you pull them out, of course, on the Sabbath. Uh, even if it's a Sabbath, you go and do that. And, and so the same idea here is um, if there's an essential service that we need because we've uh, got uh, um, uh, something has happened to us or, or something has disappeared, who knows what it is, or your house is on fire, then yeah, of course, you, you use those essential services. Um, and you do, the idea is not that you're supposed to suffer big loss because of the Sabbath it's supposed to be um, a good thing for you. So, yeah. So, the only reason I mention that is because um, 
people in our denomination that are very, very careless about the Sabbath, uh, whenever you point out, you shouldn't be doing that on the Sabbath. You shouldn't be shopping. You shouldn't be going to the movies and so forth. And they'll always come back with, well, we, we, have, we have nurses, we have doctors, and we have firemen, police officers. So <clears throat> the reason I'm bringing that up is because there's a distinction between essential services and non-essential services. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, to some people, I think it becomes an excuse to have to say that, oh, whatever they're doing is not es is essential to them, you know, maybe. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat>